Welcome to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. This episode we're going to be talking about the health of the honeybee. Before we get into our discussion, let's take a look at a DVD or at a movie called Tom Theobald on Bee Loss. Today on Earth Focus, what's behind the disappearance of America's bees? Beekeeper Tom Theobald explains, coming up on Earth Focus. If we go back to the 1940s, uh, 1950, we had about six million colonies of bees in the United States. We've lost, uh, in the past six years, we've lost somewhere between four and a half million and 12 million colonies. The winter losses that have been reported have been 30 to 35 percent, but that doesn't cover the losses that occur at other times of the year. And I was talking with a commercial beekeeper friend not long ago, and he said that the, uh, the winter figures are, are really significantly understated. He said most of the commercial beekeepers are splitting anywhere from 70 to 115 percent of their colonies. In other words, there's almost a complete turnover of that population in the course of a season, which means that in, in effect, if we have two and a half million colonies in the United States, we're losing almost all of those during the course of a season. I've seen it in my own operation. I've seen a significant decline in the number of colonies that I'm able to keep alive. And my honey crop this past season was the lowest in 36 years. Two years ago, uh, we had the lowest honey crop ever recorded since records had been kept. Before these problems began, a, a typical national honey crop would have been 250 million pounds. Two years ago, it was 160 million pounds, which was the lowest ever. Then it came up a little bit the next year. Then this past season, it was 115 million pounds. So my, my own experience reflects what's going on nationally. And it's not just national, this is global. The rule of thumb that we generally use is that uh, bees are responsible for about a third of everything that we eat. All of those plants that require pollination. There are many uh, wind pollinated commodities like corn and rice and wheat that aren't affected by the absence of pollinators, but the good stuff, the cucumbers and the melons and the strawberries and the apples and all of those things are directly dependent upon the honeybee. Globally, it's estimated that the honeybee is responsible for the pollination of about 80% of all flowering plants. And what it means to the agricultural economy is about $15 billion a year in agricultural production for the United States. I first began to see the, uh, the losses in 1995, and originally the losses were attributed to a parasite called the Varroa mite, which appeared in this country in about 1987. I first identified it in Boulder County in 1995, and that's when these losses began, and most likely those losses initially were a result of the Varroa mite. But as we began to come to terms with the Varroa, those losses not only continued, but increased. And we didn't understand at the time what was going on, but looking back, the suspicion is that these systemic pesticides were involved. Uh, the first of those, imidacloprid, was introduced. And it's my belief, based on my experience, that as we began to diminish the losses from the Varroa mite, the increased usage of imidacloprid replaced those losses. So the losses continued and continued to es escalate. Uh, the second of the systemic pesticides, clothianidin, was introduced in 2003, and the losses have been terrible ever since. The systemic pesticide, the ones that we're talking about, are a family called the neonicotinoids. They act upon the nerve receptors. They interfere with the nerve receptors. The neonicotinoids are water-soluble. 
which means that they are taken up by the vascular system of the plant and transferred to all portions of the plant so that any insect that sucks or chews on that plant is affected by that insecticide. In the case of the honeybee, there are three primary ways in which they can come in contact with, with that, uh, those systemic pesticides. The first is directly through pollen and or nectar, but there's a third avenue called guttation. Uh, it's droplets that are exuded by the plant, usually in the morning, typical of corn, and the bees will use the, that as a moisture source. Those are very high in systemics and can kill the bees outright. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. We just saw the first part of the movie on Tom Theobald on bee loss. With me, I have a guest who knows quite a bit about bees. I have St. Louis's own Jane Sumi, who, tell us about your business. My business is called Is a Bees, Beekeeping mm -hmm. Supplies and Equipment, and we're in South County. Um, well, I started this business four years ago in response to a growing number and interest in beekeeping in the metro area. So we're just a local resource for equipment. Oh, fantastic. So people, uh, there, there's a lot of folks in St. Louis who like to keep bees. Yes, and it's grown quite a bit in the last five or six years. And we think that it's in response to um, colony collapse. Well, let me ask you this. Tom Theobald, just, we just saw him talking about colony collapse, and I've heard a lot of different opinions about this. Did you think that what he said in this portion of the movie was on target, or did you find any? Did you have any issues with what he explained? No, Tom. Tom is really on top of what's going on with the bees and genetically modified. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the pollen. The, the pollen. The, right, and that really must. and how that's affecting um, the bees and affecting our food supply. He's a great proponent, uh, proponent for the bees. Fantastic. Now, now, now tell me this, just how important are, is pollination and pollinators? Pollination is hugely important um, to our food supply. It's, it's amazing the amount of agriculture, industrial agri agriculture that is dependent on honeybees for pollination. Every, almost everything we eat, a third of the food supply is dependent on honeybee and pollination. And, and basically pollination means that you have to have an insect that takes the pollen and yeah. deposits it so that the, you produce seed or, you, or the, the plant reproduces. Right. And so if you don't have pollinators, you, your, your plant crops are going to decrease enormously. Yes. Now, now, now in the movie, he talks about the decline of honeybees. Has this problem pretty much been resolved in the United States, or is, is, there, is the colony collapse disorder still an issue? It is still an issue. It's, it's been an issue for the commercial beekeeping industry. It has not really been an issue for backyard beekeepers. And we feel that it's um, several factors. One large factor, though, is the exposure to um, herbicides and fungicides that the, the backyard beekeepers are not exposed to. Oh, the, the backyard beekeepers do not get as many herbicides and fungicides? Correct. Um, I, I guess people are not spraying their yards as much as they used to. Or no, they're not. And, um, you know, the bees are, they're, the honeybee is interested in finding abundant resources. So they'll, they'll actually work um, clover and a lot of what we consider to be weeds in large areas that maybe are not, you know, being treated with the chemicals that people treat their backyards with. Oh, okay, so if they have the noxious chemicals in the backyard, the, bee, the bees might know to go someplace else. They're on plants that maybe we're not growing in our backyards. Like okay. ro roses are the last thing a honeybee would, would be interested in, and that's what people seem to grow a lot. And of course, if they use the poisons, that might be in the roses or yeah. things like that. Well, well tell me this, uh, are there any other similar losses? Are there any other problems or issues with beekeeping in, in an urban area like St. Louis? The, the things that have affected the bees and the backyard beekeepers most in the past couple of years has really been weather and drought. Bees oh. are really significantly affected by drought. In the summer of 2012, and all through, yeah. even the fall and the winter 2012, there was very little rain. I can yes. remember that the, the TV would be saying over and over again, and I would notice that, that 
you know, there just, there just wasn't very much rain. Right. And the rain affects how plants grow. And if plants are not growing and they're drying up, they don't produce any nectar. And that's what the bees are, are and, working. And that's a, that's a really important point that you're making because for a lot of people, you know, bee is just a bee and insect is just an insect. And a lot of times we don't think about the interconnection right. between insects and plants that the plants need the bees to pollinate and the insects need the plants. And Absolutely. So, so it's, it's all very connected and, and bees, honeybees are not the only pollinators, but it, they are the most important right now because of the way we grow, the way we run agriculture in this country is just um, on a very large scale. And honeybees are movable, transportable because they live in these colonies and these boxes that commercial beekeepers can move around and put the bee in the place where the plant and when the plant is, is blooming. So you don't use bees just for honey, you can use bees for pollination also. Yes, in fact, uh, that is the main use for the honey bee in the United States and at this time. It used to be uh, they were honey producers, but um, the, f the um, pay or the fee that beekeepers are being paid now for pollination far exceeds what they can earn um, harvesting honey. Okay, well, uh, on that thought, let's take a break. We're going to look at some more of Tom Theobald, and then we will be back in just a minute. Clothianidin is very toxic to bees, and when it was first introduced, we were told that something on the order of 50,000 parts per billion would be necessary before we would see a noticeable effect. Then with experience that was lowered to 8,000 parts per billion, then 4,000 parts per billion. What the science is showing us now is that minuscule amounts can have profound effects. A, a level as low as one tenth of a part per billion, one part per trillion, can have effect, an effect on the honeybees. And, and the modes of action are multiple. In some cases, they can kill the bees outright. In some cases, they can compromise their immune system. They can uh, compromise their navigational ability, their memory. They have many modes of action. And it's not just the bees that are affected by these. The effect that they have on the soil is to sterilize the soil of microbes and beneficial organisms and earthworms. Uh, after a few years, exposure to the systemic pesticides, the soil is virtually inert. By my estimate, it's used on over 200 million acres of farmland in the United States. In addition to that, it's used extensively in urban and suburban environments for control of turf insects, uh, insects that cause problems for trees. So the, the environment has been virtually saturated with these chemicals. The bees cannot avoid them. The original studies were done with uh, imidacloprid in France. And uh, the, the reason they were done was because the French beekeepers noticed a huge uh, loss of their colonies with the introduction of imidacloprid. Remember, imidacloprid was introduced in about 1993 or 1994. France banned imidacloprid in 1999, and Germany banned clothianidin two or three years later. It's also been banned in Slovenia and in Italy. And what we saw was a rebound of the, of the bees in those countries, most dramatically in Italy. In France and Germany and Slovenia, it was only a partial ban. It was banned on certain crops, but not on others. So the bees weren't completely free of it. But in Italy, the primary vector was corn. And they found that when they banned the use of clothianidin on corn, there was an immediate recovery the following year, both in the number of colonies, the health of the colonies, and the honey production. The studies are done by the chemical industry, not by EPA. EPA uh, tells the chemical companies what sort of studies they want done. The chemical companies conduct those studies. And the one that was critical to clothianidin 
was what's commonly referred to as the life cycle study. The life cycle study consisted of putting four colonies of bees on two and a half acres of, of crops treated, the seed treated with clothianidin. What, what is completely disregarded is the fact that a, that a colony of bees will forage over several thousand acres. And I've used the, the comparison of a rancher who's concerned with his cattle getting into noxious weeds. He might plant two and a half acres of noxious weeds, put four cows on those two and a half acres, but not fence those acres. Those cows are free to roam over thousands of acres. And what sort of results do you think you'll get? Well, you know what kind of results you'll, you'll get. My 12-year-old granddaughter knows what kind of results you'll, you'll get. She called that a bogus experiment, and it was. And yet the EPA accepted that, called it scientifically sound, and they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Now they're trying to deny it, that it wasn't important. It was the key study upon which conditional registration was granted to clothianidin, and it has failed to satisfy the requirements of registration. I have a suspicion, as any reasonable person would, and that is that it returns about a billion dollars a year to the chemical industry. The chemical industry believes that it's, that it's crucial to American agriculture. That's certainly debatable, but in the opinion of myself and many others, it's clearly failed to meet the requirements of registration. Why it's still on the market is a question that the EPA has to answer. The precautionary principle is a principle that's followed in most of the European countries and most of the other countries, and it, it means that we err on the side of caution. That a chemical is not released to the market until its safety is assured. Here in the United States, it seems to be the other way around, and what the EPA and the chemical companies have done is they have turned the environment into the experiment and the people have become the guinea pigs. We're the experimental animals. The bees really are the indicator species and they're telling us something and we need to begin listening. They're just a part of what's going on here. The effects of these systemic pesticides are dramatic and global. They're persistent, they're per pernicious, and they're having a devastating effect on a wide range of the environment. This is Don Fitz with Green Time TV. I am in the middle of discussing things with J Jane Sumi about beekeeping in the St. Louis area, and we just saw the second portion of the movie with Tom Theobald talking about bee loss. Uh, Jane, you're with Isabees, is yes. that correct? And yes. you, that, uh, you sell supplies for people who want to have bee colonies in St. Louis. Yes. And of course, you can leave the colony in your backyard forever. Yes. But if you have an orchard and they, the orchard needs to be pollinated, what do you do with that box that the, that the bees are in? You can screen it up and strap it up and move it. Uh, they're completely transportable. In fact, uh, most of the bees in the country at this time are used. It's called migratory beekeeping, and they're used for pollination. And uh, pollination is, is so important to our food supply right now. And Tom Theobald's point is that um, beyond uh, the concern of honeybee health for mm -hmm. beekeepers and the honeybee, we should all be concerned about the, what's happening to the honeybee because it affects our food supply and in, in essence affects anybody who eats, which is everybody. Right. So it really is, it's, the honeybee is an early indicator of what potentially could be um, real problems for our food supply. And, and tell me if my understanding is correct, what would, could affect us most is the, health, is the food which is the most healthy. 
Yes. And that is fruits and vegetables. What it's going to have the least effect on is things like wheat. Correct. Uh, which, I mean, and, and the fewer bread products we eat and the more fresh fruits and vegetables we eat, then the better off we are. Right. Now, I, I can't help but ask you this question, and, and that is, when people think about beekeeping, a lot of times they think about being stung. Mm -hmm. H have you ever been stung by a bee? I am stung all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so don't keep bees if you're allergic to them. Right. Okay. Absolutely. You should not keep bees if you're allergic. But um, you, people should know that the reaction of the swelling and itching is not an allergic reaction. That, mm -hmm. that is a normal reaction to the, to the poison in the, in the um, venom. Now, have, have you ever known somebody to be seriously injured from if, yes, we have had beekeepers who have um, been, kept bees for a long time and have had no problems and then become allergic and they've had to be treated uh, for that allergy. Oh, okay, and so bee, beekeeping, we could say, is something that is rewarding and a lot of fun, but you need to be very careful yes. about it. It's, it's rewarding and challenging at the same time, and, and we feel that um, a lot of people, are it keeps their interest for that very reason, because it's so challenging. Now, now tell me, we, we, the main thing that people associate with bees is, is honey. Yes. Now, about how much, first of all, how, about how many bees are in a hive, and about how much money would you, how much honey would you get from that sure. hive? Sure. Um, a colony starts out in the beginning of spring, uh, about 10,000 bees. Mm -hmm. um, this is when the queen starts to lay eggs again, mm -hmm. so it's seasonal. And then by the peak of the season in July and August, there's anywhere between 60,000 and 100,000 bees in a colony. Mm -hmm. a, col a healthy colony uh, will produce between 50 and 200 pounds. 200 pounds would be the best uh, harvest that you would expect from one colony in this area in 2012, 2013. Well, a uh, uh, hundred pounds. A hundred pounds would be average. Yes. Okay, so so if you did that, you probably would not eat all that honey yourself, and you would probably want to share it with some other people or sell it or something. That's what everybody, everyone uh, goes through that experience where they get more honey than they can uh, consume themselves. So you start to give it away, and it gives you an opportunity to share people with people your beekeeping experiences, it's great. Okay, and so again, the, the time that you said is the best to start is, is in the spring, is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay, it's not, it's not like planting trees when you start in the fall. You want, you want to start in the spring, so actually the cooler months would be the best time to actually start thinking about, about when, if you want to keep bees. Yes, getting bees uh, is a springtime activity. Now you can certainly start thinking about the bees and get some education, take some workshops, mm -hmm through um, fall into late winter and early spring, and then be prepared to get your bees in, let's say, the mid-April mid to early May. Okay, we only have about a minute left. Tell me, what sort of things happen in St. Louis where people can get some education about bees? Sure, there are three or four really well-organized local clubs, and many of these local clubs give beginning workshop or advanced workshops in February, February seems to be the, the month that, um, that these clubs hold these workshops. And then uh, they provide mentorship and ongoing classes through Jane the year. Jane thank you very much uh, you. for being on Green Time. I want to thank our viewers to watch and be sure to tune in Green Time this time again next week.